I just want to say welcome to the series on Living Free in Christ. It's a, a long time coming, a lot of water under the bridge in my own life. I had the privilege to teach at Talbot School of Theology for about 10 years. If you asked me during that period of time who would be the next potential Chuck Swindoll or somebody like that, I'd have to put this man uh, about at the top of the list. He won a homiletics award. He was uh, an outstanding senior preacher. He was gifted. His grade point average was almost perfect. Uh, he was Mr. Personality. He was our Christmas banquet entertainment two years in a row. Uh, he was one of the few students that graduated, turned right around and helped me in my department teaching homiletics. He was in the ministry for two years and bombed out. He attended one of my conferences and afterwards this very gifted, intelligent, personable young man wrote me this. I've always just figured I was a rotten, no good, dirty, stinking sinner, yet saved by grace, yet failing God miserably every day. And all I could look forward to was a lifetime of apologizing every night for not being the man I know he wants me to be. But I'll try harder tomorrow, Lord. As a firstborn trying so hard to earn the approval of highly expectant parents, I've related to God the same way. He just couldn't possibly love me as much as he does other better believers. Oh, sure, I'm saved by grace through faith, but really I'm just hanging on until he gets tired of putting up with me here and brings me home to finally stop the failure in progress. He said, wow, what a treadmill. Neil, when you said you're not a sinner, you're a saint, in reference to our new primary identification, you totally blew me away. Isn't that strange that a guy could go clear through a good seminary and never really latch onto the truth that he is indeed a new creation in Christ? I'm convinced that old tapes laid down in early childhood could truly under, uh, hinder our process of understanding who we are in Christ. Now count on it, and we're going to share how throughout the time that we're going to have together. Anybody who works with people for very long know that people do not inherently feel good about themselves. We don't come into this world with a great sense of identity, much less a, an appreciation for who we are. Studies have shown that in the homes where we're Really, parents should know better. For every affirming statement that a child would hear, they get 10 negative statements. In schools where teachers are taught to know better, it's 7 to 1. 7 non-affirming statements to 1 positive affirming statement. The study went on to find out what it would take to negate the effect of that. And about 4 positive statements are necessary to negate the effect of 1 negative one. Well, that's a 40 to 1 disparity ratio in our homes. If I was to ask you the question, who are you? What would be your normal response? Well, my name, I'm Neil Anderson. No, who are you? Oh, well, uh, an American? Well, no, that's where you live. Uh, well, okay, a seminary prof. No, that's what you do. A Baptist, you're grasping for straws. No, that's where you go to church. A Republican, that's my political affiliation. Well, the point of it is we have a tendency to get our identity out of the things that we do. Now, I submit to you that's really as a result of the fall. What if you couldn't do them anymore? A man has a tendency to get his identity out of his job or his work. A woman has a tendency to get her identity out of being a mother and being a, uh, having her children. But what if you couldn't have children? What if you never got married? What happens when the empty nest comes? What happens to you if, if you lose your job? Do you lose your identity? Now there's a multitude of ways of how people identify themselves and oftentimes it's out of the things that they do. One of the saddest ways, I think, that people get their identity is, is out of their race or their nationality or their background. Here's the saddest in my estimation. When I was born, I was black. When I grew up, I was black. When I'm sick, I'm black. When I go out into the sun, I'm black. When I die, I'll be black. But you, when you were born, you were pink. And when you grow up, you're white. And when you get sick, you're green. And when you go out in the sun, you're red. And when you go out in the cold, you're blue. And when you die, you turn purple, and you call me colored. <laughs> now, the tendency is to think, oh, come on, that's no big deal. I know who you are. What's with this identity thing? I see you up there, 5 feet 9, a little over 150 pounds. All right, quite a little over 150 pounds. But is this me? If you chopped off my arms, would I still be me? Chopped off my legs? Transplanted my heart? kidney, liver, wherever it's at, would I still be me? Now you keep chopping, you'll get to me because I mean you're somewhere. But when the Bible says we recognize no man according to the flesh, now think about it for a moment. Don't we? 
Isn't that our primary means of identification? In terms of our physical being? You and I are created in the image of God, and God's a spirit. If I'm absent from the body, present with the Lord, who's the I that's present with the Lord? You see, this old earth suit I got here is passing away, folks. And so how, who are we? And I think to answer that, we have to go back to the beginning. Take your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis chapter 1 and look at the original creation. God had breathed into Adam and he became a living being. Now that incredible combination between dust and divine breath is essentially what you and I are made of. Now, when he became a living being, he was living how? And the answer is he was both physically as well as spiritually alive. Now, what's the difference, critical difference? To be physically alive means that your soul or soul spirit is in union with your body. What would happen if you physically died? You'd be absent from the body, present with the Lord. In other words, your body would separate from your soul or soul spirit. Now, to my knowledge, hang on to this, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the idea of being alive means to be in union with, and to die means to be separate from. Now remember that, because when we realize later on that we're alive in Christ and dead to sin, in what way have we separated ourselves from sin? Now that's a critical understanding we'll deal with later. Uh, but he was also spiritually alive. Now spiritual life is different, because that's your soul or your spirit in union with God. When God breathed into Adam, he became a living being. He was both physically and spiritually alive. He said, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, on that day you shall surely die. Well, he ate. He died. Physically? No, he lived about 900 and some years. But he died spiritually, separated from God. Before that happened, look at the original creation. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, we read, Then God said, verse 26, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish and over the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. See, they had creeps then too. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. Now, when you realize at that time of creation, living in the presence of God, physically, spiritually alive, Nobody would have to write a book, search for significance, because it was built in. They had a divine purpose for being here, to rule over the birds of the sky, the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea. So as an attribute of creation, that sense of significance, that divine purpose for being here, was already established. Uh, not only that, but they had a sense of safety and security. Later on you will read that all that God had made was good. How safe could you be if you were living in the presence of God and without sin. And they had a sense of belonging, not just to God, but to each other. The first thing that God said was no good. It was no good that man be alone. God had created Adam first. In Genesis chapter 2, you get an expansion of that creation account. And he came to him one night and said, I got the perfect thing for you. And they said, well, really? What is it? Well, it'll be a complementary relationship and somebody just like you all your life. He said, well, how much will it cost me? And God said, an arm and a leg. <laughs> he thought for a moment, said, well, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> now, you know the real story. <laughs> God caused a deep sleep, and he took a rib out of him. And now I like what the Living Bible says. This is it. <laughs> That's what it says. And it's kind of been it ever since. But they were naked and not ashamed. All of that was in creation. A sense of belonging. Safety, security, significance. And then what happened? Well, he ate that apple. Now look what happened. Critically, we need to understand this. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Now, dear Christians, God knows where they're at. Uh, he's asking for some sense of accountability. And he said, well, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Now, again, he knows the answer. He wants some accountability. And this is what he said, verse 12. The man said, 
while this woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. It's not my fault, it's communism. <laughs> See, we've been doing that ever since. You know, passing our blame off to somebody else. Obviously, God's not going to let them get away with that. Now, what I want you to see, however, is that something significant happened to man as a result of the fall and sin. They spiritually died. And the first thing you see is something happened right here to their understanding. How in the world do you hide from an omnipresent God? And so somehow his consciousness in terms of his relationship with God was distorted. Something happened to the mind of man. Now, I want to look at this in a three-dimensional way, the mind and uh, the emotion and the will. What happened to his mind? Well, the idea of knowing was no longer relational. Now, this may be one of the hardest things to get across tonight uh, because it, it isn't for us either, especially in our Western world. To us, knowledge is nothing more than accumulation of data. You can know if you just simply had a computer or a vast a library where you, you could look up information. And we test people to see how much they know. And if they could uh, memorize a list, then we say, aha, you know. Well, that would never be a Hebrew understanding of knowing, for instance. In Genesis 4.1, Adam knew Eve, and she conceived and bore a child. Now, what does it then mean to know? Well, actually, if you look throughout much of history, it was understood that God was the center of knowledge, that was the center of our universe and thinking. Even in the Dark Ages, when you saw artworks, usually they were of the, the Virgin Mary or the Madonna, the Peace Child, etc., uh, but when the Renaissance came and the Enlightenment, uh, suddenly the whole Western civilization changed. They threw off God as the center. Man became the center, and knowledge became nothing more than a collection of data. Now, obviously, this is not a new problem. It was all really as a result of the fall. But you start to see it take a different shape in the New Testament. When the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we read that passage in John 1, has a different meaning to us than it must have had at that time. Uh, the logos, the word, that's what the Greek philosophers debated on Mars Hills. Uh, that was the, the ultimate of philosophical notion. That was, that was the truth. That's what they were pursuing. And for Jesus to be said of him that he was the word and he became flesh, that it was incarnated, became personalized, would have been a mind blower to those people. I mean, most of the Heretics would have immediately uh, questioned the validity of that kind of a statement. It's a difficult thing for us to come to terms with because he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the word. You really can't separate the person of Christ from his word. The word of God is living and sharper and active than a two-edged sword. What word are they talking about in Hebrews 4? Well, I'm, most of my life I would have said, well, the Bible, of course. Actually, I think they're talking about Jesus. If you look at the whole opening argument of the book of Hebrews, they're presenting Jesus as greater than the angels, greater than Moses, greater than Aaron. Truth of the matter is you can't separate them. Now this has a profound effect on how we understand Christian education and what knowledge is. Being a seminary prof for a number of years, the scariest thing I can share with the public is that you could graduate somebody from a seminary purely on the basis that they answered most, not even all the questions right. Well, you could do that and not be a Christian. I personally feel that the number one problem in Christian education today is we have the wrong goal. We've made doctrine or knowledge an end in itself. You do that, you'll distort the very purpose for which it was intended. Paul says very clearly the goal of our instruction is love. What's the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you've done that, how much have you done? All the law and the prophets. So what's the purpose for the book? It's to govern my relationship with God and man. That's why you know my disciples for their theology. <laughs> Didn't sound right, did it? You'll know my disciples for their love. You see, you could know all about this Bible and end up nothing more than a noisy gong and clanging cymbal. Paul says that kind of knowledge puffeth up, but love edifies. The whole plan of God beyond salvation for you and I is that you and I conform to his image that they could look upon us and say, behold how they love one another. It's character transformation is what it is. Something happened to the mind of man. Notice how Paul explains that in Ephesians chapter 4. 
uh, verse 17, he says, The Gentiles who walk in the fertility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding. Why? Because they're excluded from the life of God. Now, what's life there? That's your soul in union with God. That's why he would say in 1 Corinthians that there is a natural man cannot discern the things of God, for they are spiritually appraised. Well, you and I as Christians, we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he would lead us into all truth. That truth, hopefully, would set us free. So something happened immediately to the mind of man. And the real issue is being separated from God, having no life anymore, no longer having the mind of God within him. Now, something happened to him emotionally as well. He became immediately fearful and anxious. Just finished a book called uh, Freedom from Fear. Anxiety disorders have now replaced depression as the number one mental health problem of America. People everywhere are feeling anxious. We are living in an age, age of anxiety, experiencing a blues epidemic. Depressed and angry. Cain and Abel brought their offerings to God, and for whatever reason, God didn't accept Cain's. And his countenance fell. And God comes to him and says, why has your countenance fallen? Isn't it because you're not doing what is right? But if you do what is right, won't your countenance be raised? But sin is crouching at the door, but you must master it. What he's saying there is an interesting principle. You don't feel your way into good behavior. You behave your way into good feeling. New Testament would say, if you know these things, happy or blessed are you if you do them. So here you are, fearful and anxious. First emotion expressed uh, by fallen humanity, I was afraid. Now that's such a huge issue, we're going to come back to that later on. But let me just say this. Why is the fear of God the beginning of wisdom and knowledge? How is it the one fear that can expel all other fears? And I think I can safely say this. Fear of God, of anything other than God, is mutually exclusive to faith in God. Something is controlling your life that God never intended to be doing. Uh, they were shameful and guilty before they were naked and not ashamed. There were no dirty parts to their body. Sex was not, was not sinful. It was only sin that, that caused it to be ugly and degrading to humanity. Uh, you could, as a Christian, have devotions and sex together with your spouse at the same time in the presence of God. Read the Song of Solomon. There's nothing evil about that at all. That's something God created. But when the fall came, suddenly they wanted to hide and cover up. People were frightened to death that somebody may find out what's really going on inside. So emotionally, they had fallen. Their will. Before the fall, they only had one bad choice. Don't eat of that tree. See, that's the power of the law. Which one did they eat of? The only one Bible records, they ate of that one. And after that, the whole plan of Christian living was distorted. The greatest power you possess, dear Christian, is the power to choose. Other than the Holy Spirit in your life, the greatest power that you possess is the power to choose. You can choose to be here or not be here. To read your Bible, not read your Bible. To pray or not pray. Every, every Christian here, daily, until the Lord comes back for us or we join him in the air somewhere, can make a choice to walk by the Spirit or by the flesh. That's a, actually a choice that you and I have. God gave us that switch as part of being created in the image of God. Now, all of that happened mentally to this man. Look at the effects of the fall. Suddenly cast out of God's presence. Some have suggested the station of the cherubim at the gates to Eden uh, was not to protect them from coming back, but guard them so they could. I don't know. Uh, but the point is, is, is that uh, they sensed that rejection. They wanted to run and to hide. And consequently, from that time on, there was an overwhelming need that they all had to belong. Now, don't just diminish this very easily. This isn't just some psychological jargon that we pass around. But that need to belong is so evident in our society that if we don't understand it, you'll never understand peer pressure. Why do our kids have to feel like they belong somewhere? And it isn't just kids. Our, our men join moose lodges and elks lodges and wear silly outfits because they need some sense of identity to belong. We're here in Southern California. Do you know that Los Angeles is the gang capital of the world? Somewhere about 140,000 of our young people are involved in some gang get their identity out of that. Why do they do that? Policemen are warned against it. 
parents pray that they don't, and yet they do. Because it's an identity. It's some sense of belonging. I, I found this in, in my own ministry in years past. I could give somebody, lead somebody to Christ, but if I didn't give them a friend, chances are I'd lose them in my church. In fact, one study was done by Wynne Arn in the Institute of American Church Growth a few years ago. And his study said, if somebody comes to your church, and if you don't give them six or seven major social contacts, within six months you'll lose them. So that need now to belong. Remember before, that was an attribute. Now it's a need. Uh, guilt and shameful, therefore a need of acceptance and affirmation. People feel guilty. Feel shameful. As a culture, in my childhood, we were a guilt culture. I've done something wrong, and I feel bad about it. We are quickly moving to a shame culture. I am wrong. There's something wrong with me. So they felt guilty and shameful. They felt weak and helpless. Therefore, some need of, of strength and self-control. And here's a tragic thing, because more people look at this and say, well, I've got that control, but their control is not of themselves, it's of everybody else. There is nobody more insecure than a controller. Now, all of this is a result of the fall. Three chapters into the Bible, and, and we see a fallen humanity. Now, keep this in mind, because there's only one thing that changed. They couldn't blame mom and dad. They couldn't blame the social order. They couldn't uh, attribute this to their friends. There was no disease at that time. There's only one thing that changed from Genesis 1 to Genesis 3. Adam and Eve died spiritually as a result of sin. Now, it doesn't take a genius to recognize from that time on what God's plan is to restore a fallen humanity. From that point on, Adam and Eve, who were born both physically and spiritually alive, and died spiritually, separated from God, from that time on, everybody who enters planet Earth is born physically alive but spiritually dead. Ephesians 2 1 says, having been born dead. Born dead? Still born? No, born physically alive, but spiritually dead. So during those early formative years of our life, everybody here learned to live their life independent of God. Where would they find their identity? Not in the relationship with God. They didn't have one. They would have to find it somehow in this world. And everybody has, for that matter. And then you see that whole progression. Of, of, of God bringing the law and hopefully that man could live somewhat in harmony, maybe under some covenant relationship with God, but the law, as you know, failed. I think God set up a classic scenario. Let's take one man in the Old Testament and make him the king of Israel. Let's give him all the money he needs. You still hear of King Solomon's mines. Uh, and, and let's put him in power at the time of that nation's greatest prominence. And so here is a king who had all the money that he needed to do whatever he wanted to do. And he had the position to do whatever he wanted to do. And he sought to find purpose and meaning in life independent of God. So he tried almost everything. And he wrote a book about it. Which one is it? Ecclesiastes. What's his conclusion? Meaningless, meaningless, vanity, vanity, says the teacher. And here we are at the end of our 20th century looking into another whole millennium, quoting the philosopher, I'm the master of my soul, I'm the captain of my fate. Oh, no, you're not, dear Christian. God never designed the soul to function as master. You are either serving God or mammon, and any one time being deceived into thinking that we're serving ourselves. And so here come all those silent years. And then suddenly, the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. John 1, 4 says... And in him was the life, and the life was the light of the world. Light does not produce life. Life produces light. Here's the last atom. I didn't say second. This is the last atom. Like the first atom, Adam and Eve were born both physically and spiritually alive. So was Jesus. See, I don't believe in the virgin birth because I need to believe it to prove the Bible right. That would be nonsense. I believe in the virgin birth because I believe what Jesus came to do was to give us life. That's what Adam and Eve lost. That's what Jesus came to give us. But unlike the first Adam, he was tempted in every way such as man, yet without sin. And even as he went to that cross, he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Now what did he come to do? What essentially 
is the gospel that we so critically need to understand. Well, one thing he came to do, very important, is to model for us how to live a life that was dependent upon our Heavenly Father. We'll come back in another series here and talk about temptation. But let me summarize something. All temptation is an attempt to get you and I to live our lives independent of God. That's what it is. It's not the opposite sex. It's not the apple. Those are the things the devil may use. But truth of the matter is, the intention behind that is to get you and I to live our lives independent of God. Now, if you can't see that in the life of Christ, let me explain something. To equal the odds here a little bit, the Lord fasted for 40 days and was hungry. Isn't that a trip? I fasted four hours once, was famished. But anyway, <clears throat> 40 days, the Bible says he was hungry. And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. This wasn't a question of, of the devil trying to go after Jesus. The Holy Spirit led Jesus out into the wilderness. And then the devil came to him and said, If you're the Son of Man, turn this rock into bread. And he responded, Man does not live by bread alone. He must have peanut butter. <laughs> no, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, what actually happened here? See, what did the devil want Jesus to do? The devil wanted Jesus to use his own divine attributes independent of his Father. That would be sin. But he would not. He declared again, only by that word which proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, if you go through the Gospel of John, you will read out of his own lips, I did not come on my own initiative. I do nothing on my own initiative. You can do the same study of the Holy Spirit. He would not speak on his own initiative either. Everything flows from the Father. All temptation is an attempt to get you and I to live our lives independent of God. And so he modeled something for us. How to live our lives in a dependent relationship. Uh, but secondly, he came to die for our sins and to give us life. Now, I think personally that we have missed something in understanding that this life-giving Adam came primarily to give us life. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Now, how would you understand that? He who believes in me will live spiritually, even if he dies physically. You see, eternal life is not something I get when I die. I used to believe that years ago. But let me just say this as strongly as I can. If you don't have that spiritual life before you die physically, you've got nothing but hell to look forward to. He who has the Son has the life. I'm the bread of life. If you're a child of God, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's what he came to give us was life. Now life determines our identity. When he uh, looked at the, in the Gospel of John, he said, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become sons of God or children of God. See how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called children of God? This is our great identity. Now all this is wrapped up in one little prepositional phrase that's so easily missed and yet is so critically important how you and I live our lives. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3 just to illustrate this. And as you turn into Galatians chapter 3, let me just reflect on another epistle. In the book of Ephesians there are six chapters. In those six chapters, there are 40 references to you being in Christ or in Him or in the Beloved. One of the most repeated prepositional phrases in the New Testament. That's what spiritual life is, to be in Christ, to be in Him. It means your soul is in union with God. Again, let me stress, eternal life is not something you get when you physically die. Now notice what it says. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for you are all, what are all of you? Sons of God. How did you get there? Through hard work. No, through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. How did you identify yourself before? Well, I was a man or a woman or a Jew or a Gentile. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free man. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one. How? In Christ Jesus. That's the gospel, folks. Look at chapter 4, verse 6. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, why is this so foundational? It isn't what you do that determines who you are. It's who you are that determines what you do. And no person can consistently behave in a way that's inconsistent with how they perceive themselves. So who are you? Oh, I'm just a sinner. Well, what do sinners do? Sin. What do you believe in is your core identity? Sin. You know, one of the intriguing parts about this is, is how we gravitate back to the Old Testament to find out who we are today. Let me illustrate. How many would believe as a Christian that your heart is deceitful and desperately sick? See, most of you don't want to raise your hands, but <laughs> you're probably, oh, yeah, sure, of course it is. I don't believe that's true, Christian. You got that out of Jeremiah 17. Find a similar passage in the New Testament about a believer. Isn't one of the great prophecies out of Ezekiel that he would put a new heart and a new spirit within us? That's a bad way to explain why I'm not functioning very well in my Christian walk. That's not true. We're saints who sin, so knock it off. See, you don't have to. <laughs> but if, if, uh, if that's who I am, then I've got to just live out who I am. But beloved, now you are a child of God. There are 220-some references identifying you as a saint in the New Testament. There's about 300 and plus uh, passages that identify a non-believer as a sinner, but not you. Nowhere that I know of. And yet somehow we just kind of believe that. And consequently, we live according to our self-perception. This isn't just power of positive thinking. This is truth. And believing it doesn't make it true. It's true, therefore, I believe it. Now, consequently, uh, we have come, I think, especially here in America, to a time when we've presented our people only half, maybe only a third of the gospel. We presented the gospel this way. That Jesus was the Messiah, came to die for our sins, and if we will receive him into our life and believe in him, then we die, we'll get to go to heaven. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, two things are wrong with that. Number one, it would give you the impression that eternal life is something you get when you die, which is not true. And secondly, it's only half a gospel. If there's a dead person over there and you wanted to save him, what would you do? Give him life, I guess. But if that's all you did, he would only die again. Now, if you wanted to save the dead man, you'd have to do two things. You'd have to, first of all, cure the disease that caused him to die, and the wages of sin is death. So Jesus went to the cross, he died for our sins. Is that the whole gospel? No, finish the verse. But the free gift of God is eternal life. That's what he came to give us. Now, how important is that to know? Well, if all I did is have half the gospel, if all I am is a saved sinner, I'm probably just going to live out that perspective in my life. That's not all who I am, though. I'm a child of God, by the grace of God, not anything I could do. I'm a saint who does sin, but I don't believe you have to. I've written these things unto you that you may not sin, but if you do, you have an advocate. You also have an adversary who will accuse you of every time you do it, but you have an advocate. But the only means by which I can live out my Christian life is to understand that I already am a child of God. It's one of the greatest paradoxes in my mind that we can convince our Christians that you're just sinners, but if they don't act like saints, then I'm going to have to discipline you. Is that ludicrous or what? That's like telling my dog, you're really a cat. If you don't meow like one, I'm not going to feed you anymore. <laughs> He's going to sit there and wah, 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 you know, die of starvation. You got to be who you really are. And that's why scripture is trying to affirm to us his spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. Romans chapter 8. Now here kind of the punchline for the night. And all the people, our ministry has had the privilege to help all over the world. Didn't make any difference where we went. Didn't even make any difference what the problem was. Whether it was an eating disorder or panic attacks or severe depression or just general defeat. They all had one thing in common. None of them knew who they were in Christ. Now why not? Where's the Abba Father? If the Holy Spirit's bearing witness with our spirit, why weren't they sensing that? The incredible thing is, once those conflicts were resolved, 
suddenly that connection was there, that Abba Father was there. And that's our deep, great desire for everybody here and everybody listening is to have an opportunity to bring about genuine repentance, to establish that truth in our life, the Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth with that truth set in us free. Turn your page in your syllabus here, and I want you to just read out loud who we really are. Now, don't believe me, but believe the Word of God. And we're going to read a list here. Don't read the verses. Don't read the parenthesis. But I want you to just read out loud with me together. I am the salt of the earth. I am the light of the world. I am a child of God. I am part of the true vine, a channel of Christ's life. I am Christ's friend. I am chosen and appointed by Christ to bear his fruit. I am a slave of righteousness. I am enslaved to God. I am a son of God. I am a joint heir with Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. I am a temple of God. His spirit dwells in me. I am joined to the Lord, and I am one spirit with him. I am a member of Christ's body. I am a new creation. I am reconciled to God and am a minister of reconciliation. I am a son of God and one in Christ. I am an heir of God since I am a son of God. I am a saint. I am God's workmanship, created in Christ to do his work that he planned beforehand that I should do. I am a fellow citizen with the rest of God's people in his family. I am a prisoner of Christ. I'm righteous and holy. I'm a citizen of heaven and seated in heaven right now. I'm hidden with Christ in God. I am an expression of the life of Christ because he is my life. I am chosen of God, holy and dearly loved. I'm chosen and dearly loved by God. I'm a son of light and not of darkness. I'm a holy brother, a partaker of a heavenly calling. I'm a partaker of Christ. I share in his life. I am one of God's living stones and am being built up as a spiritual house. I'm a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession to proclaim the excellencies of him. I'm an alien and stranger to this world in which I temporarily live. I'm an enemy of the devil. I am not a child of God. I will resemble Christ when he returns. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. I am not the great I am, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Amen? Amen. Oh, you said, I'd be uh, prideful if I believe that. No, that's not true, Christian. But you're defeated if you don't believe that. You and I are not that because of what we have done. We are that by the grace of God only. But I am what I am by the grace of God. Now, why is it so important to understand this? Because all your life, you've been told something else. Most of us who didn't come to Christ until later on in life have been told something totally different from this, and your mind has had that programmed over and over and over and over and over again. And to help our people constantly be reminded, it's the Holy Spirit who bears witness with our spirit, we're children of God. One of the great works of the Holy Spirit is to communicate God's presence to me. Let me just close with a quote from one of our great Christian statesmen, I believe in this century, John Stott. He said, in practice, we should constantly be reminding ourselves who we are. We need to talk to ourselves uh, and ask ourselves questions. Don't you know? Don't you know that you have been united to Christ in his death and resurrection? Don't you know that you have been enslaved to God and committed yourself to his obedience? Don't you know these things? Don't you know who you are? We must go on pressing ourselves with such questions until we reply, Yes, I do know who I am. I'm a new person in Christ, and by the grace of God, I shall live accordingly. No person can consistently behave in a way that's inconsistent with how they perceive themselves. So according to the Bible, who are you? Beloved, now, now, not later, now, you are a child of God. And the one who realizes that, in that spiritual union with him, cries out, Abba, Father. Lord, thank you for that truth. And God, may that be realized by every person that's here and listens. 
May we come to the understanding that all you've asked us to be is to be the person you've created us to be. And God, we commit ourselves afresh to be in that. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.